Good morning and welcome to the 19th annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cell technology at the Hanover Fair. We've been here since 1995 talking about important issues. We have a specialist in one issue. The gas specialists are here. We'll be talking with Marcus uh, Bachmeier, who's from the Linda Group, about um, hydrogen and the solutions to infrastructure. Uh, please welcome with me Marcus Bachmeier. So, um, uh, Marcus, it's almost an embarrassment to ask this question because most people know, but could you tell us briefly about the Linda Group? What, what, what do you people do? Good. Um, I'd be very happy to. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the group has been founded, or the company has been founded in 1879, so it's over 130 years old. Uh, it was founded by a gentleman, Carl von Linde, who was a university professor, he was an inventor, and he was an entrepreneur as well. And his first important innovation was to build a cooling machine which was commercially usable. And that cooling machine was very, very important, for example, for food and beverages, um, also for, for, uh, for beer brewing, which was in, in those times, which was banned in summer because the beer would turn sour so quickly. So he allowed the breweries, especially the Munich breweries, where he made that invention in south of Munich, um, to store beer longer, to uh, to turn beer into an uh, to an all-year product, and also to export the beer. So whenever you have a beer today and in the future, think of Carl von Linde. Um, based on that invention of the cooling machine, um, he developed what is called air separation units. Again, you cool down the ambient air until nitrogen and oxygen liquefy, and then you can separate it because it, se it liquefies it at different temperatures, and these air separation units still are a very important product of our, of our company today. Today the company is around 15 billion in sales, um, wow. five-sixths uh, five of that is industrial gases, all the way from industry, uh, hydrogen, healthcare, uh, consumer applications, food and beverages, still food and beverages, and about one-sixth of, of the overall revenue is engineering of big chemical and process plants. We're here on the hydrogen fuel cell uh, stand and of course uh, many people are asking us when we're going to get applications on the road and one of the issues behind this question of course is well when is the infrastructure going to be there so we're stuck with this issue of um, I'd love to have a hydrogen car um, and if I want to invest that money so I want to know where I can drive. Um, how are we going to approach the issue of creating a, an infrastructure that will help the consumer or help the public identify with hydrogen as a source of energy, yeah. as a carrier, yeah. I should say, of yeah. energy? Yeah. So, first of all, you already have some cars on the road, you have some buses on the road. Um, you may have seen the cars outside in the open air exhibition space. Um, if you haven't done so, um, go there, take a test drive of these hydrogen cars. It's really a beautiful experience and it it tells more than a thousand words. Um, we also have a, there's also a bus out there which is, which is running on hydrogen. Um, I, I think you can take bus rides as well, of course you can't drive the bus, uh, but again, please do that. And when you talk about infrastructure, you really need to differentiate between the different market segments. One, and uh, you start with passenger cars, but I, I would like to take the freedom to start with buses. Mm -hmm. Transit buses, in my eyes, uh, especially when you look at it from an infrastructure structure perspective. Transit buses should be a prime target for hydrogen. These buses, for a number of reasons, these buses um, are not only emission free in a sense of, of, um, of gas particles, uh, but they're also very, very low noise. Transit buses typically are run in densely populated urban areas. So the people who live there benefit from the first moment those buses start running. Very low noise, no emissions locally. Uh, also those buses, and that's a big difference to the passenger cars, those buses run typically 12, 14, 16, 18 hours a day. Six days a week, seven days a week. You will never achieve that with a passenger car. So this means for the technology, for the fuel cell technology in the buses, um, you get many more operating hours, you get much more operating experience, you can fix those problems that arise much more quickly because you get so many operating hours. And the other one, and again, that's our perspective, perspective from the infrastructure perspective. With passenger cars, and we'll be talking about that in a second, with passenger cars, the chicken and egg problem 
um, cars or stations or stations or cars. Um, it's not so much a question what needs to come first. When you talk about private cars, the station network, at least as Antoine also mentioned, at least the base coverage needs to be out there in the country before private customers decide that this car gives them enough freedom uh, to, to buy such a car. Because passenger cars are about the freedom to go where you want, when you want, any time of the day, any time of the night, and fill up where you want. So with buses, this part of the equation is much simpler because you have one operator, typically in a big city like Hanover, like Hamburg, uh, like Berlin, you have one operator of the buses or maybe two operators. They have a very clear plan. They typically start with a few buses and if everything goes well, they increase the number. So the infrastructure cost can be tailored to the number of buses. And that's very, very important because with passenger cars, the stations need to be there out first before the car numbers will ramp up. So passenger car stations will be underutilized, which is going to be very costly. Bus stations, you can really tailor to the demand. And that's, that's some of the reasons why we think buses should, uh, should receive much more attention than they already have today when it comes to hydrogen fueling. Mm -hmm. uh, I might add, uh, we're going to open this forum uh, uh, to questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, just raise your hand here. Oh, we've already got one question. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this gentleman here. Thank you. My name is Theo Holtum, and my company is Green Hydrogen Consulting. And um, I'm very sorry to report that I've just recently discovered in the UK we have a green bus grant and uh, okay. section, uh, I think it's 3.12, says hydrogen buses do not qualify. Isn't that terrible? It, it breaks I, my I, heart, I, but I it hope, probably I breaks your by, heart as well. Yes, I hope yeah. by asking this question yeah. and maybe speaking to a few people in the UK, we might get that changed for future rounds. That would uh, be good. In the, in the next good. year. Okay. But um, this, I think this is exactly the sort of thing which maybe the EU can... Uh, perhaps exert some pressure to avoid. Uh, it's totally illogical. And we, I think we, our politicians are there for leadership and on strategic issues. And this is a, a prime example, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Would you like to, uh, one of the interesting conundrums there is uh, what pressures lead to that. Uh, you mentioned the noise pollution, which I think is significant. Um, we did have one British product here. It was a stealth police cruiser. And the idea is you have a hydrogen-driven car that is so quiet you can creep up behind criminals. Now, I stood in front of this car. It is phenomenally quiet, um, but when you consider the noise pollution side and then you add the other dimension which is uh, the Germans call it Feinstaub there are particles from diesel motors already right now in Berlin on certain city streets the pollution has gone beyond the level at which uh, the legal limits were set so factually they should shut down traffic now uh, this all turns back to you um, uh, where do one where do you feel frustrated by the lack of development and where do you feel encouraged about the application I, I agree with you that the buses are the first step um, uh, or a very important yeah. step to establishing an infrastructure an acceptance a demonstration an integration of this technology into the population uh, but where do you think the uh, the problems lie and why are we not moving forward more quickly I, I wouldn't want to talk about frustrations on stage, sorry. <laughs> um, th there may be some, but uh, let's, talk about, let's talk about those things that go well. Um, of course, sometimes things don't move as quickly as, as, as you would want. Uh, that's in many industries. Uh, that's in many businesses as well. Um, I, I think what is very encouraging is that there's a number of, um, a number of manufacturers out there both in the fuel cell area as well as in the bus area and especially in the car area. And um, let's not talk a little bit about cars because most people have a car. Um, m most people are interested in cars, at least the male part of the population. Um, so everyone can associate with a car. Um, I think it is a very good sign that um, in the last couple of months, a number of car manufacturers have publicly shown a renewed interest in hydrogen cars. 
Uh, one, I think, is BMW, who announced that cooperation with Toyota in, I think, November, December last year, uh, where they also announced that they will cooperate on, on fuel cell technologies. I think this is a, this is a brilliant sign. Um, the other one, which I think is, is very, very welcome, is that uh, Daimler and Ford and Nissan joined up forces uh, to jointly develop hydrogen cars by 2017 uh, in order to bring up volumes with those two additional manufacturers, Ford and Nissan, which I think between them account for something like 10 to 11 million cars annually. Um, and they, they will be bringing down cost as well. Um, I think it's a very welcome sign that Hyundai started up serious production of the iX35 model, uh, which is a medium-sized SUV in their Ulsan plant. Uh, I think that was something around February 2022 this year. Um, and they will build a thousand and so, and they expect to build tens of thousands of cars by two, uh, 2015 onwards. And I think um, the last very welcome notice in my eyes is really that Volkswagen, which is, uh, I think, the second biggest manufacturer in the world. Um, Volkswagen has announced uh, that they will cooperate with the Ballard Corporation. I think Ballard is somewhere around here um, on developing fuel cells for cars. So now, um, when you look at the big car manufacturers in the world, nearly all of them are in a certain stage. Some are farther advanced, some are at an at a, at a earlier stage, but they're all they're all uh, pursuing hydrogen technologies. And I think that's a very, very good sign. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if there's any question from the audience, just uh, raise your hand. One of the issues that we ran into here um, uh, years back is uh, we had a demonstration of an absolutely clean uh, vehicle running on hydrogen. Um, and some clever journalist sat down and figured out that we are driving the hydrogen tanks with diesel trucks to a certain area, um, they're loaded onto other inefficient technologies. By the time you deliver the hydrogen to operate that one bus, um, uh, you've used so many fossil fuels that in fact the hydrogen bus becomes inefficient and it even adds pollution. Uh, the big question, we talk about green hydrogen now, um, because hydrogen is like electricity, it's only an energy carrier. You are the gas specialist here. Uh, when you talk about this bus system, the first question uh, one really has to ask is, where are we getting the hydrogen from? Is it a clean, renewable source? Are we firing up a cold plant to run an electrolyzer, or do we have better sources? And is hydrogen the best use of electrical energy? So how do those questions fit in? Well, well I'd like to, ask the, the, to answer the last question first. Uh, is hydrogen the best use of electrical energy? I would say the best use of electrical energy always, always, always is electrical energy. Uh, because as soon as you start to convert it, you will have efficiency losses. You will have losses in the transformation. But uh, we will have, depending on the country you're in, in this country, we will have increasing pikes of wind energy and photovoltaic energy which cannot be taken by the electrical grid because there are no uses for it at that very po point in time. So hydrogen will play an increasing role also as an energy, as an energy storage medium. And then when you have already converted the electricity into hydrogen, using it for transport, in my eyes, is one of the wisest ways. Of course, you can turn it back into methane uh, and, and put, it into, put it into the natural gas grid. Um, you can technically do it, whether it makes sense commercially, whether it makes sense for a country. We can discuss that. You can put hydrogen into the natural gas grid. Uh, that's, also, that's also good because there is a tremendous storage capacity in the natural gas grid. Um, but still, I think the most valuable use of that very valuable hydrogen is really to put it into cars and buses. So the mobile application is the application you see as the first um, to deal with the problem that we're wasting energy right now. The, the, uh, Germany is now dumping electrical energy, shutting down wind turbines, uh, because the grid is um, overtaxed yeah. with this extra. So the first application you envision is the mobile application. Yeah. That's, what, that's what my expectation is. Mm -hmm. uh, the second issue, of course, one thinks about, uh, Germany is really almost at the cutting edge here, um, and we're faced with issues. Uh, there's so much wind energy available uh, if you access all of that. 
um, but it immediately leads to the issue of storage. Now, I'm not really sure whether the natural gas grid can deal effectively with uh, gigawatts, potentially gigawatts of energy that are being produced um, without a consumer. Ener electrical energy needs to be used now. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what does the storage issue look like? Is it, is it, uh, um, are there limitations? Do you see a solution to storing uh, such large, potentially large quantities of energy? When we start with the natural gas grid, um, the natural gas grid, um, I hope the numbers are right, I heard the natural gas grid has like a storage capacity of 110 terawatt hours. I don't know whether, whether there are any experts in the, in, in the audience, I'm not an expert on the national gas grid, but that's what I heard and I, what I heard is that the, the storage requirements for electrical energy, for excess electrical energies, is something like 40 terawatt hours. Mm -hmm. so, so the natural gas grid size would allow for that storage. Okay. So that's, uh, I think that's very, uh, a very important message. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's already there, it's invested, you see those gas tanks, um, that's a good thing. The question is how do you best use hydrogen for that? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feed it into, into the grid where, where the relatively expensive hydrogen competes with, with uh, relatively cheap natural gas, yeah. still relatively yeah. cheap natural gas? Mm -hmm. That's more business questions, political questions, funding questions, uh, legal questions, what kind of feed-in tariffs will there be? Uh, but from a technical perspective, this could be a good solution. Okay, we almost have to wrap things up now. If there's a brief question, okay, one brief question, I'm gonna have to run around <laughs> to the back of the room here. Um, there you are. Hi. Uh, as you already mentioned, the, the electrification of transport is going to play an important role uh, in establishing a hydrogen infrastructure. And the way toward the electrification of transport, we got the, the hydrogen fuels as on one hand, but we have the batteries uh, on the other hand. How do you see the interaction between these two technologies? Are they competing? Are they supposed to compete? Or is there some way of cooperation between, between them? Like, what is your personal opinion coming from the hydrogen fuel cell side of the, of the uh, picture? So, so what I expect, and that's, um, that's based on a lot of, a lot of studies uh, our partners and we did, uh, what, what we expect is different segments. We expect that battery vehicles um, will be relatively small vehicles, two-seaters, small 40-seaters. That's what you see on the road today. Uh, we expect battery vehicles, battery cars, um, to be used predominantly in urban areas, in city areas, where the driving distance is relatively short and where people have um, um, a well-planned pattern of using the car. Uh, because whenever you need to recharge, you need to put it into your daily schedule. It's not that three-minute fill. Uh, that's the one segment we see. Smaller cars, city traffic, uh, a relatively high share of battery cars. When you look at medium-sized cars and large cars, like Volkswagen, Golf, Passat, uh, BMW 3 Series, 5 Series, um, end up, what we expect is when people want to drive longer distances, where the refueling time starts to become, starts to become an issue, um, where, the, where, the, where the load of, or the weight of the batteries would become tremendously huge. Um, that's the segment where we expect hydrogen cars to have the biggest market share. And of course, um, there, will be, there will be cooperation between both segments. When you look at the, uh, at the electric motors, when you look at the power electronics, uh, many of those components can be shared or are the same between a battery car and a hydrogen car. Um, at, at, at the borderline between those two segments, of course, there will be competition. If fuel cell cars get on the road, get attractive, get low cost, if there's the infrastructure out there to refuel, um, fuel cell cars will take a bigger share of the overall segment. If battery cars increase, uh, increase the storage density r r dramatically, if, if they get the cost down more quickly, if also a public charging infrastructure is being built up quicker, then the battery cars will, of course, eat into the segment of the, of the fuel cell cars. So it will be both. Um, it will be complementary, complementary, that's what I expect, but at the edge there will be competition. 
We've uh, been talking with Marcus Bachmeier. He mentioned at the beginning, uh, whenever you drink a beer, think of Linda. Um, I thought about Linda a lot last night <laughs> here at the uh, public forum, I must confess. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, the gas specialists uh, are just around the corner here. Their booth is B77, and uh, Marcus Bachmeier will be happy to continue the conversation there. We've run out of time, but it's been a pleasure talking to you. Hope to see you here next year. Brian, thanks a lot. Thanks uh, for your attention. Uh, hey. See you then.